American genuity cannot function without all the cogs turning the wheels. That would be our three judges. Let's meet them right now. First up, Amy Reese Anderson. Amy started her own company so she could have the flexibility to stay at home and raise her children. Featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Inc. Magazine, USA Today, and Fast Company, Amy is currently the managing partner of Reese Capital. And out of all of our judges, she's also the one that's the easiest on the eyes. What I liked about American Genuity is that it let America get involved, right? Um, we're involved with Shark Tank and watching and learning, but in this case, America gets to decide, do I want to invest? Do I want to buy their product or their service? And so it really draws everybody in. I'm really excited to be Good. here. Good. Ah, I've got we an love awesome it when you're product, excited. and I think that we should just dive in because I know you're going to love it. Sure. Let's go. So I'd love do to it. just pass these out. Just before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he uh, gave his apostles a final commission, if you like, and asked them to spread the gospel. And uh, it was a very inclusive commission. Every people, every nation, creed, color and race. The great and the unique message of the church is one simple thing, is that Jesus Christ lives. And his atonement is for all people, all races, all colors, all creeds. It's for all, and, um, and for anyone who's interested in living the kind of life um, that would grant them peace and happiness, um, it's, it's there for the offering. Um, I feel that we should be examples by just being a friendly face, by just being willing to help and not by doing anything in particular, but just by being there and being willing to support people who are not members of the church. And through that way, we can definitely show that we are followers of Jesus Christ. When you come to an understanding and a knowledge of who you truly are, um, when you learn about the Savior, um, we understand that our life is never going to be easy. We understand that. But we know that through our Savior, um, we can endure anything. If we believe the Savior's words, that uh, we should be our brother's keepers, that uh, we should uh, uh, go out and uh, earnestly seek the welfare of others, then uh, we should do it. And the more and more I meet and get to know people, the more I learn of my Heavenly Father, because we all have qualities that He has and talents that he has given us and the more I meet people the more I learn of him and learn how much he loves me. We are all equal in his eyes. It doesn't matter if I'm a student or if I'm a doctor. We are all children of our Heavenly Father. It doesn't matter what we do or who we are. He loves us all equally and he wants us all to return to him. There's no distinction of whether we sin a lot or we sin a little we are darker, white, light, fat, skinny, whatever. We, Heavenly Father loves us the same. He loves us perfectly. And I think we all are here in this life to learn to love each other the same way. Now, as you travel the world, you begin to notice quite astonishingly how similar we are rather than how different we are. Although we speak different languages and we may have different foods and unique aspects of, uh, of our culture. But when you look, even superficially, you begin to see how incredibly similar we are and that we are all humans and we are all Heavenly Father's children. I know we think ourselves as human beings having a spiritual experience, but I believe it's the other way, as spiritual beings having a human experience. And I know by being taught in the church and the things that I have I witness myself and seeing the hands of the Lord in my own life, in the lives of my family, I know that um, that is so true. All are alike unto God. One of my favorite scriptures. And um, it, it just tells, it sends the message that there isn't a difference in God's eyes in terms of His children. He's our Father, we're His children, and He loves us all the same.
In Utah's rugged sandstone canyons, it has taken nature millions of years to polish a few rough edges. Curiously enough, it'll take only a few days for Utah to smooth out your rough edges. Utah is like that. It restores your soul, rejuvenates your spirit. The last 300 million years were a tumultuous time on Earth. Extraordinary geologic events shaped Utah. Events that sculpted canyons, mesas, mountains, and rivers that today make Utah unique in all the world. A cast of characters thrives at Bryce Canyon National Park. Oh, not just the hikers and the wildlife, but whimsical spires and pinnacles called hoodoos. Only nature could paint a palette like this. So brilliant, so breathtaking, so luminescent in late afternoon light. In Utah, you'll have time for simple pleasures. So here's your Utah travel plan. Leave the commute at home, turn off the computer, and step into something a little more comfortable. Utah, the adventure begins. Doozy, the only TV show that you, the audience, create. Create, create. That doesn't sound right. Shouldn't it be creates? Can I do that over again? there, young lady. Yeah, what do you want? I think you owe me some sort of an explanation. I don't think I owe you anything. Look, I'm tired, I want to go to bed, so why don't we just finish the stimulating conversation tomorrow? Don't get smart with me, okay? What are you doing with this? What is it? Don't you tell me. Your mother found it under your mattress while she was changing your sheets. That snoopy witch. Don't you ever talk like that about your mother again. Oh, a lot you care about her. A lot you care about the both of us. I hate you. Bitch! The question of how America could tolerate this degree of inequality and prejudice seems almost uh, impossible to understand in our day when all this has been reversed. But um, in the beginning of the 19th century, it was sort of part of their sense of the order of things. They thought of, of the universe as sort of ranked 
from God to the angels to humans, and then within the humans, various ranks. Here then is Joseph Smith, who at that time, on April 6, 1830, let's not forget that he was just a 24-year-old. But what I find remarkable about Joseph is that uh, his approach was always a very humane approach. He had an understanding early on of the diversity that would one day exist in the church. I think Joseph Smith for his time would have been considered a liberal on race issues. He opposed um, slavery, even while criticizing the more extreme abolitionists. Going back to 1836, we have records that indicate that Joseph Smith began to ordain blacks to the priesthood. Elijah Abel was apparently the first. He was ordained to the office of 70. He held leadership positions, served uh, on a mission, at least one. And uh, we have records that indicate that there were several other blacks that were being ordained to the priesthood at the same time. The prophet Joseph Smith certainly had no compunction about integrating black people fully. In large part, the Mormons were in such a precarious position in the 1830s in Missouri that their inclinations seemed to be extremely progressive and liberal with regard to blacks and slavery and abolition. However, given the fact that they had personally endured not just hardships but, uh, but, but violence and expulsion from a number of, of counties in Missouri, they apparently felt it necessary to restrain any of their language or rhetoric that tended toward abolitionist language. You can be a part of this real change, while at the same time enabling villagers to hold on to the richness of their culture, a society where they are close to their families, where there is a genuine bond among friends, where there are few societal problems, little crime or violence, and a beauty that is only matched by the faces of the children. Leave my child for the red behinds, the silent twilight falls. Either from the gray rock comes to Your support of choice programs can empower poor villagers to improve their own lives through access to clean water and health care, education and economic opportunity. While it is true that the cruel reality of village poverty will not change overnight, there is a message of hope. You and I can make a difference by reaching out to help villagers help themselves. get AIDS by non-sexual, casual contact. Casual communicability is a new term that seems to have arisen just for the AIDS epidemic. Uh, you won't find that in Stedman's medical dictionary because it isn't a medical term. AIDS really is a tropical-based, I think environmental-based, and I think insect-transmitted disease. AIDS is basically a contagious disease which is also transmitted indirectly in blood. This is not a sperm blood disease. It's a virus mucous membrane disease. This is a very um, fragile virus. I cannot say that the virus is fragile. It is my feeling that if you properly taught people how to use condoms, that they could expect a very decent success rate in reference to sexually transmitted diseases. If you 
look at this study objectively, they took 10 people, instructed them in the proper use of condoms, probably gave them condoms. The result was that three out of 10 of them went on to seroconvert, which means they got infected by the virus. That is totally unacceptable. It's Rob. There's two feet of fresh powder out there, and it's a bluebird day. You know, Thomason, not only is this a great fishing spot, but it's also rumored to be the home of the great, legendary, and humongous Maynard. He's at least four feet long, and today I'm going to catch him. Fantasy. Huh? Maynard doesn't exist. I tell you what, if I catch him, you clean him. Sure. All four feet of him. All five feet of him. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. I don't think you're taking our bet very seriously, are you? <laughs> you know what? Thomason, you really can't handle the lightning serve. Oh, really? So what was the bet again? Loser in tennis, caddies in golf. And the loser in golf? Has to play the last hole in nothing but their golf shoes. <laughs> we better start talking about the product. I hope you have your shoes all picked out. <laughs> Very funny. Should we uh, play that last hole now? Love to. Could you hand me my bag? Well, why you have this Could one? Could you please hand me my bag? Sure. Oh my. Nice shot. It's my best hit yet. 
You know, I really think those clothes were holding me back. Tell you all, you, all you need are pine metal clubs, a Brunswick bag, and a ball. I think it's helpful to see the similarities first because it, it draws us into this common humanity. And once we see ourselves as us and we have this common sense of humanity, then we can talk about where we're different. What, what does each person have to contribute um, to community, to the body of Christ, to other relationships, um, gifts, strengths, talents? In one aspect of my life, for a while it was my whole life. It consumed me when I was in a relationship and tried to get out of a relationship and tried to live the gospel. It was everything I thought about. And now that I'm moved past that for me and struggle with different things, with children with problems, uh, more and more I realize it is a, still a part of me. Not that I want that life at all, but I'm not afraid of that. I accept that. I don't deny it. It's just part of who I am, and I'm here because of that. I mean, I'm talking today because of that, and I help, I'm able to help other people because of that. This is the walk that I've had, and, and there's value in that, and there's value in the walk that you've had, and it's, it's a little bit different than, than what I've experienced or what I've perceived. And then coming together, yes, absolutely, we find our commonalities, but also in our differences, I believe that the, that the process of living is, is enriched for everyone. We're experiencing the same mortality, and though our experiences are gonna be different, we still are all gonna get bumps and bruises along the way, and by focusing on that unique aspect, we can have a lot more understanding and empathy for each other. An important aspect of our common humanity is that all of us struggle, and whether we're in the church or out of the church, we have struggles in life. All of us have a thorn in our side. We all have a burden that we carry, something that can be um, a gift to us if it brings us to God. And if we can see that as our common ground, that each one of us has a thorn, that we're not so different from one another, and uh, then we don't have to look at each one of our thorns and say, well, that one's this and this one's that, and these people are, 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 are bad. Um, we're all bad. We all need the atonement. We all need um, the Savior's love. We'll never make it through this life without it. But how it is we feel the Savior's love is through each other. It's through each other. It's when somebody loves me and doesn't love me less because of my thorn, because of my struggle. That, that I feel to, to turn to the Lord. When I feel his love and I feel that I belong somewhere, whether it's a family, a congregation, but I feel that I belong there. When I think of myself identifying who I am, I think, you know, first and foremost, I go back to my uh, primary days. I'm a child of God. I truly believe that with, with all my being. And I hope I see you as a child of God and I hope that that's who would, people would see me as first and foremost. I know Heavenly Father does. I know the Savior sees me as a child of God first. Yeah.